What's up, everyone? Good morning, and welcome to Resurrection City Church. Um, I noticed this morning when I got to church um, that Zach is wearing a gray t-shirt and black jeans, and I almost wore black jeans today, and we would have matched perfectly, which would have been cool or embarrassing. I don't know which. Um, (laughs) uh, My name is Joel. I'm one of the pastors here at Res City. Um, Special welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time uh, this morning, whether here in person uh, or online. Uh, We are in a series this summer where we're going through the book of Jeremiah, um, and we are trying to allow ourselves to really be challenged by the word of this prophet who uh, spoke in in a different time than us and kind of spoke to people who weren't really interested in listening, um, and, and because of that, like, there's a big disaster that kind of is at the background of the, of the book, but uh, thankfully, um, this message of Jeremiah was left for us by people who uh, thought that it needed to be retained, and it's been put into our Bible now so we can learn from it. So we're trying to do our best to figure out, you know, how does this prophetic word from God through the prophet Jeremiah still speak to us to challenge us, to uproot and tear down, as uh, the prophet says, but then also to build and plant, which is our our series uh, uh, title, Build and Plant, as you see on the screen here. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we are going to get into it. Lord, thank you for gathering us here this Sunday morning um, from wherever we're coming from, God, whatever uh, situations maybe we're, we're coming from, whatever hardships uh, or celebrations that we have this week, God. Um, you have brought us together into this place so that we may worship you together, we may uh, learn from your word together, and that we may have fellowship with one another, Lord, um, in your Son. So I pray that you bless us as we do that. Help us to, to learn from you um, through uh, this message from Jeremiah and, um, and bless us as we uh, just do all of that together this morning. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the late 1800s, um, there was an exciting new fashion trend that sort of swept through upper class women here in America. Uh, the Washington Post, uh, writing at the time, called it, quote, a hot fad for fancy ladies. I'm going to guess a guy wrote that. Um, and I don't know, do any of you have any guesses what this fad might have been? You probably won't guess it, so uh, I won't make you, like, you know, yell it out uh, for a while or anything until someone gets it. It's actually the bicycle. Which is, that was like a fashion statement at the time, to, like, ride a bicycle around town. Um, and so anyway... It was, you know, an exciting thing for a little bit, but soon after, you know, it was kind of seen as like all fads are, and, you know, people were calling this fad dead, okay? So again, the Washington Post wrote this, okay, believe it or not, the popularity of the wheel is dead, (laughs) okay? Judging by the fact, I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess almost all of you rode in a car here or rode a bike yourself. So we've been proving that statement wrong for like an entire century since then. Like if there was a tournament for like the most wrong statements in all of history, like this would be a one seed, right, in one of the brackets. This would be a clear contender for one of the top seeds. A couple other contenders, okay? Listen to some of these. This is a quote from a a U.S. politician named Arthur Sommerfeld. Before man reaches the moon, your mail will be delivered within hours from New York to Australia by guided missiles. We stand on the threshold of rocket mail. Okay. I didn't get the year that that, that was, I forgot to write down the year that that was written, but. Okay. Uh, another one uh, by Charles Duell. He's a commissioner of the United States Office of Patents in 1899. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Okay. Suspect. Okay, clearly these assessments by, you know, quote-unquote experts of their day were totally wrong, right? We can kind of see that very clearly, like there was absolutely no merit in anything that they were saying, right? Bicycles are incredibly popular. We live in one of the most, um, you know, uh, bike-heavy cities in the whole country. None of us are getting rocket mail. I don't think any of us would want rocket mail, right? That sounds like a really bad idea, okay? And clearly, Charles Duell saying that everything that, you know, had been created, uh, what was created already, clearly was not creative enough to envision the slap chop or the shake weight or Crocs, right? Like this, you know, there's so many more things to be invented that this guy could never have guessed, right? The obvious sort of, you know, thing 
that we should take from this is that, you know, relying on old ways of thinking or conventional wisdom or just sort of like what everybody believes is often wrong. Like, we, we clearly understand that that's the case, right? It just goes to show how wrong we often can be in our assessment of situations. Whether we're experts or, or just, you know, down-to-earth regular people, we can often be wrong about things. We routinely miss things, and not just like in a small way, but like very badly, right? Like some of these statements, um, you know, kind of show us. Now that doesn't, you know, that, that takes place in, in our regular lives, or kind of stuff like we talked about here, but it also often takes place in us missing what God might think about a situation, okay? We can often fill in what, you know, what we think He must think about a situation, or what He must be doing in some situation, and, and we can often be wrong about that, Okay? Last week, we talked about holiness. We talked about God's radical otherness, his set-apartness, this, this quality that he has which separates us from him and which gives us the identity as we follow him of being holy ourselves, being set apart. And we talked about how we have to take that very seriously in our own lives. I want to kind of press into that a little bit deeper, use that a bit, as a bit of a jumping off point for us today, as we talk about, you know, one of the ways that God is other than us, that he is set apart from us, and that is that his ways are not our ways. They are irregular. They seem strange to us, okay? So today I want to talk about God's irregular ways and the challenge for us in the fact that he thinks differently than us, and we can often miss that. And I want to talk about why it matters for us to try to discern what that looks like and how important it is for us to not maybe rely on our own patterns of thinking when it comes uh, to approaching God. Okay? Consistently, Scripture uh, confounds, you know, tells us that God confounds the accepted wisdom of the day. It's actually a feature of the gospel. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, the God, you know, God's good news of what he's done in Jesus is, you know, it seems absurd to, you know, the quote-unquote wise or the powerful. Those are the words that he used. Um, and, and Christians and the whole church, we get into trouble when we forget that that's the case, I think. So we need to be in a regular posture of expecting that, of being humbled by it, and by trying to figure out what it looks like for us to live it out in our day-to-day lives. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to reflect on a passage uh, from Jeremiah to illustrate this. And it's from chapter uh, 24. I'm going to read the beginning of the chapter, but it it drops us into a pretty pivotal moment um, in the story of the book of Jeremiah. Okay, so I'll explain it here in a second, but first let me read to you uh, verses 1 and 2. After Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah and the officials, the skilled workers and the artisans of Judah were carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. One basket had very good figs, like those that ripen early, and the other basket had very bad figs, so bad that they could not be eaten. So let me explain what's going on here. Let me give you some background. Judah has this looming disaster that's kind of taking place, or that it's a, that's about to take place, that Jeremiah has kind of been talking about throughout the whole book, and that's sort of the center of everything that's going on, this looming uh, disaster that will, will come upon them if they don't turn from uh, their ways of pursuing idols, of, of, of rejecting God, of turning from Him, and going after the other nations. Um, but that actually, this judgment kind of actually takes place over kind of two stages, okay? There's, it's kind of, and it's separated out by about a decade, and, and the book of Jeremiah covers both of these. So the second one, we've talked about this a little bit more in other sermons in the past, involves like the destruction of the, the temple and the city of Jerusalem, right? It is like a, it, it is a really bad one. It's the kind of, you know, thing that is really looming behind everything. Um, but the first one is when Babylon comes in and deports many of these top officials of Judah. Okay, so think about it for a second. If you're Babylon, you're a mighty conquering nation, you're trying to be the big kid on the block in this region at the time. Um, when you want to make a nation that is, you know, uh, not be a threat to you, you want to kind of make them subservient to you in some way, and actually work for you, what you do is you kind of come in and you do a bit of like a brain drain. You kind of take away some of their top officials, and in this case it included prophets and priests. You take away some of their skilled laborers, okay? And you make them work for you now instead. You kind of bring them with you, you put them to work building stuff maybe for your army or for your people so that can kind of supply their conquering of everything. Um, And anyone else who might 
you know, you get rid of anyone else who might be instrumental in uh, creating a rebellion. So you just get rid of any people who could really create a problem, and you turn it into like a you know, solution for you in, in many different ways, all right? And so that's what happened, right? Uh, Babylon has come in. They've kind of removed a lot of these top people, uh, including the king, and they put in place a puppet king, someone who they think is going to work for them and kind of, you know, do things for Judah that are in Babylon's uh, best interests. Okay, and, they, and the king that they put in charge is a guy named Zedekiah. Um, and long story short, he's a really bad puppet king. <laughs> he's so bad that Babylon comes back and finishes the job uh, about a decade later. Okay? But what matters here for us today, what I really want to talk about, is that because Babylon has done this, there are now two communities of Judah, two communities of Israel. The ones who stayed, the ones who got to stay in the land, living still in their sort of ancestral homeland, still kind of going about their daily lives in, in a regular way, you know, a little bit changed, but still, still living normal lives. But then this group of people who got deported and taken away and are living in Babylon. So you have this fairly large settlement of Jewish people that are living in Babylon. These two groups of people separated. Um, and in this vision, where we have these two baskets of figs, the two baskets of figs are right, representing these two communities of people. One of them is good to eat, and one of them is bad to eat. Okay, now I like to help us enter the world of the Bible as much as possible. So here's some figs, in case you ever wondered what figs look like. If you're like me, the only time you've eaten figs is in a fig Newton, right? So you maybe just kind of want, want to know what do these look like actually. So here you go, some figs. Um, they're actually referred to very commonly in the Bible because it was like a common source uh, of fruit in that region and a chief sort of sweetness actually. So anyway, figs, there you go. Now back, back to Jeremiah here. So Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel, or Ezra 1 to 6 actually inform us that there's a bit of a tension that existed between these two communities of people, okay? If you were to guess which of these is God referring to as the good figs, do you think? The ones who are lucky or blessed by God, the ones who God was looking out for. You probably would say like the obvious answer is the people who got to stay in, in Jerusalem, right? That's the ones who, you know, looked like they had things going for them. They got to stay in their homes. They got to stay in the land that they knew, the land that God had given to their ancestors, to be, you know, used for God's purposes. You would think the ones who are staying in the land are the ones who God is favoring here, okay? They have the opportunity to, to start over again, to build, again, the crisis is maybe past, and now God is going to do some good stuff through these people, right? They had to be the ones that God was protecting, the ones who the future of Israel, the future of God's purposes for this people are likely going to come through, right? That would be the common expectation, and you might even start to think that the reason that they got to stay was because God favored them. Okay, maybe he thought they were the good and faithful ones, the, the ones who were, you know, should be rewarded for their piety because they had been so good. And so because of that, God would use them to bring about these redemptive purposes for Israel. Okay, now using that logic, the ones who got uh, to go to Babylon, you would probably think that they were the bad figs. They'd been deported, right? They were probably unfaithful. This was probably a punishment, right? This is probably what they deserved, right? That's like the obvious conclusion we would make looking at these two situations. It's kind of common sense. You wouldn't even think that hard about this probably, right? If you were kind of reading just this part of the passage and learning one of these is good figs, one of these is bad figs. Okay. God is going to explain to us that, his, that this expectation needs to be totally reversed. This is what he says in verses 5 to 7. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Like these good figs I regard as good, the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. The future lies with the people who've been taken off into exile, even though they don't deserve it to be so. That's what a commentator named John Goldingay says. Okay? And we'll talk more about these people here in a few weeks. Jeremiah actually uh, writes a letter to this community to kind of tell them, this is what it's going to look like for you to actually live well in Babylon so you can be these people who God is going to bring his redemptive purposes through, okay? 
But the important point for us today that I want us to really reflect on is that God has chosen them. And the plan for redemption, the work that he is planning to do for Israel uh, to redeem them, to bring them back to himself, will ultimately progress through these people. They are the good figs. Now, let's be clear about what's going on here, okay? The, the point about giving them a heart to know me is not God saying that they are, you know, they've been rewarded for something good that they've done, and that's why they've gone off into exile, and that's why God is going to work through them, okay? That's not what's going on here. They're still just as much under their critique of the book of Jeremiah as everybody else, okay? They have plenty of their own issues, Okay? They're not going to be the future of Israel because they've been so righteous, but God says that they will be the ones that he chooses to bring about these redemptive purposes through. He is going to choose to use them okay, to, to bring about his purposes, to make them good figs. He will build them up and plant them instead of uprooting and tearing them down. And he will leave the people back in Jerusalem uh, uprooted and tore down. They are going to be the ones who are actually going to be uh, the ones who experience the brunt of God's judgment. He says this in uh, verses 8 to 9. But like the bad figs, which are so bad they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so I will deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah. Remember, this is the, the new king that's been put in charge of Judah by Babylon. His officials and the survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt, I will make them abhorrent and an offense to all the kingdoms of the earth, and a reproach and a byword, a curse and an object of ridicule, ridicule wherever I banish them. So the conventional wisdom says these are the ones that God must favor. These are the ones who God is going to bring his purpose through. Okay? The other ones are under judgment. They're going to fade off into history down the road. We won't even remember that they existed probably when we're celebrating how God has worked through these people who are still in the land. But God says, no, that's not going to be the case. They're going to see uh, the brunt of this judgment that is coming. And that's the one we talked about that happens about a decade later. Okay, so that's what's going on here, okay? We find that God has ways that operate outside of the conventional thinking. It challenges the people uh, of Israel's time, the ones that Jeremiah is speaking to, to con sort of confound what their expectation might be. And they say that God is doing something sort of beyond their understanding in a way that they wouldn't necessarily predict or expect or think would be the case based off of how they would do it themselves, and so when we kind of come to this, it really offers us a bit of a challenge. We have to ask ourselves, um, you know, what can we learn from this? And so what I want to do is I want to talk about that, okay? And, and for me, the big takeaway here, if I had to put it down into, you know, a sentence is this. God isn't bound by our value systems or our expectations, okay? God is not bound by the things that we might value or the things that we might expect, the conventional wisdom we might put on things, all right? We have all kinds of metrics that we might declare if we were looking at this situation, right? And we might say, well, these are the good figs, right? We, we, we could definitely come up with our own vision for that. And that's probably what happened in Jeremiah's time. But often it would come down to, you know, who we are or what we would expect to happen to, to good people, right? And, and there's this thing, we're learning more and more about this, I think, as we do studies about it. And there's you know, probably more names for it than even this, but there's this thing called the affinity bias or the, the similar to me effect, okay? I think we're all kind of becoming a little bit more aware of this, but let me just explain it to you real quick, okay? So here's a quote from someone named Felicity Menzies. She says that studies show that, in general, people extend greater trust, positive regard, cooperation, and empathy to in-group members compared with out-group members. And from a number of we another website, I couldn't... Uh, get a name associated with this, but thedecisionlab.com. Um, the, the similar to me effect is a cognitive bias that explains our tendency to prefer people that look and think like us, okay? So we just naturally are going to look at people who look like us or, you know, are blessed in some way that we might think would be good and think, you know, they're the good guys. We, va we should value them. We should show worth to them. Okay? Essentially, these studies are showing that we are often trapped in these biases that cause us to favor people who, you know, look like us, right? Whether in how they dress or their skin color, whatever. They just kind of look like we do. 
um, people who vote the same. They're of the same generation as us. They are the same ethnicity, the same education level, uh, the same gender from the same region or city of the world or country, etc., right? We just are naturally going to favor people who like that. It's just kind of part of how we're wired. Now, I don't think it's necessarily sinful that we unconsciously do this, but oftentimes it does lead to sin, okay? We're going to perceive people's value or worth along these lines, and we're going to treat them accordingly. We're going to, in how we operate our lives, we're going to favor people like this. In the systems that we're a part of, we're going to often find that they tend to favor the people who run the systems or who are more prominent in them, okay? So, for example, uh, the other night, uh, here, right here, I wasn't, wasn't able to make it to this, but we had a group of people who gathered to watch a documentary called 13th. Um, and it, it kind of highlights this extreme disparity that we've often found in America between uh, blacks and white people who have been incarcerated. Just, you know, it tends to, you know, far more be that black people find themselves in jail and discriminated against because white people have tended to be, you know, more in charge. And so the systems kind of tend to reflect that. And so our laws and our enforcement of them tend to tilt towards who is more dominant in a society, right? Just something that when we really look at, we see this, unfortunately. And I'm sure you can think of, of lots of other examples of this, too, okay? But it just kind of shows how per- pervasive that this can be. When we come to this passage, what, what we find is that God does not operate trapped in these kinds of biases. He is not subject to them. So when he chooses what he's going to do, he stands apart from any sort of bias, any sort of uh, thing that would might trap how he would view a situation. Okay, it's one of the ways that he's holy and we're not. And going further, he's not going to be beholden to maybe our culture's value systems and how he chooses to work or to reward or punish people or, or choose who to work through. Okay, this is a key part of the gospel. God's grace, his favor, we're told, comes to people indiscriminately from all groups, right? Without any sort of uh, preconception of who should get his grace and who shouldn't based on how you know, we might uh, uh, assign value or worth in our society. God doesn't care about any of that and how he chooses to assign his grace, how he chooses who he's going work to work through. He doesn't work through or, or necessarily have to move by people who look like us, Right? Um, he doesn't have to assign value to those who we might think would be good figs and, and who we might think would be bad figs. He shocks us oftentimes in how he moves. And, and we find that we don't get to pick who he chooses to move through and bring his future through. Now, when we look at the early church, we find that they actually took this very seriously in how they tried to assemble themselves when they gathered to worship God, okay? So in a letter that was, you know, li- likely written to be passed around to many churches, um, the, the early church leader, James, says this about one kind of bias that we often find ourselves having in a society uh, between favoring uh, the rich over the poor. So here's what he says in James 2, 1-4. My brothers and sisters, believers in our gracious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you know, sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges which eat with evil thoughts. Okay, he says, you're treating you know, one group of people like they're good figs and one like they're bad figs, and you're doing so based on the normal evaluation of people that you get from the wider culture. And you take it and you bring it into the church. And that's not okay. That is not okay for you to do. Okay? And I, I, listen, I imagine like, we would still do something like this today. Okay? Let's do a little thought experiment. Let, let's, let's imagine that Elon Musk, who's supposed to be the richest man in the world, walks in the door, okay? I'm sure our impulse would be to make sure he feels pretty comfortable here, right? We would probably want to make sure, you know, that he, he felt, like, pretty honored and, like, we knew who he was and that everything was going to go good for him and we were really happy that he was here. And if he started attending, imagine he started tithing, like, we would really show him a lot of appreciation. And honestly, like if Elon Musk tithed 10%, like we would probably be able to buy Allianz Field for cash, 
and just start meeting there, right? So that'd be, you know, pretty interesting. But think about in our rush to honor this person that society and our biases might tell us matters more than other people, we would miss a minority immigrant couple who walks in the door or a poor college student who, you know, is, is hardly able to tithe anything. We would probably find ourselves missing them right? Our just attention, it wouldn't be probably that we don't like them or we think they're bad or we don't want them here, but our attention would just be locked in on the person that we have been sort of uh, wired to show favor towards because of the society we live in and because of the biases or the preconceptions that we have about people. What James, you know, is calling out here is our uh, tendency to do that and saying it really has no place within the church, now, we can do this in a lot of different ways. He's talking about rich and poor here. We can do it with a lot of different things, right? It, it could be anyone that we think that ought to be more favored or that God might favor more than others, right? Again, people who just think like us or who look like us or who vote like us, whatever it is, the things that we put a lot of value in like that. Maybe it could be people that have, you know, t- at least to us, they seem to have the perfect life, right? They look like they have it all together. They look like, you know, when, when you... They, <laughs> When you watch a commercial, right, you, you think, oh, that, that's my, right, my friend looks like that. You know, they must be pretty great, right? People like that, we're going to tend to show them some sort of value. They've accrued through some cultural value or worth that the society around us puts on them, and we're going to naturally favor them. What we're doing is we're imposing our value system, our unconscious biases, onto God's holy place. Remember, holiness is about being set apart. It's about being different than the world around us. And James is saying God does not take kindly to us imposing those types of value systems and reinforcing them within his holy people, his church. It is not okay, and we have to be watching ourselves to make sure that we're not doing it. Okay, James says this is like us putting ourselves up as judges. That's, what, that's the word he uses, as judges. Okay, dividing ourselves into different baskets of figs based on our different biases. But remember, God is not bound by these, okay? He is not beholden them to all, uh, beholden to them at all. And he has his own value system that he is calling us to replicate within his body of people. James talks about that here in verses 5 to 7. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are, you? are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? He's saying the ones who are often in charge or have the most resources, because, again, the, the systems, like the world is kind of, it's easier for them to get what they want through, that, through those. It's kind of built for them and by them, okay? They have a hard time seeing their need for God, okay? They're not going to be rich in faith, he's saying, oftentimes. And so James is saying, don't honor people like that, okay? Because God is not going to work through people like that. He's looking for people who are poor in the eyes of the world, okay? God's value system is to work his future through those who are, okay, rich in faith, though viewed as lacking in some way based on some other value system, Okay? Because think about it. Often those who are rich in faith are, are looked down upon by, you know, in the eyes of the world. But God has chosen to work through those who are rich in faith. Now listen, rich in faith doesn't mean that they're perfect or, or pure or innocent. It just means, I think, that they recognize their need for God. Okay? They understand, like, I need God. I need to be rich in, in what is honoring to God. I need to be rich in faith and seeking Him out. Okay, Look, let's go back to Jeremiah 24, for example, okay? God has been saying all of Judah deserves this looming punishment. And, it's, and, and, and the, the, the people in Babylon are not being exempted or, or God is not choosing to work through them because they're perfect or they're good or they're innocent or they're righteous, okay? But think about this. That group, scared and in an alien land, poor in the eyes of the world, is much more likely to be rich in faith because they are going to be looking to God to save them. They're going to be much more aware of their need to have God work for them. They're the ones that are crying out for God's future. They're, they're longing for him to work. And when we extend this out into the New Testament, we realize that what God is doing 
ultimately is, is bringing Jesus. That is the ultimate hope that those people were looking for. And when we look at Jesus, we find someone else who was very poor in the eyes of the world. Someone who died shamefully on a cross. You know, capital punishment executed like a common criminal. But Jesus is the one who God brings his future through. And so to be rich in faith is to look to him as one who can, that, that God will work through to also work his future through. That we can be part of the people that God is working his future through. The challenge, though, of, of this, okay, and the thing we need to really wrestle with is that being privileged, okay, being rich in the eyes of the world often means we're going to struggle to see our need for a holy God. And I think that's why throughout Scripture we find God so often working through people, singling out people who are poor in the eyes of the world but are rich in faith to bring his purposes through. Barren women, those with, with low status professions like shepherds, Okay, we don't really realize, like, shepherds were not the kind of people that you thought were an honored um, profession within society. Yet, it is a very important group of people throughout the whole Bible. God is always working through them. Prostitutes, people with disabilities, eunuchs, okay? All things that we would say, probably the bad fig basket. Probably not, you know, finding their way into the basket of the good figs all low on the rung of cultural value systems, all poor in the eyes of the world, but all people that God wants to work his future through, people who have the capacity to be rich in faith. Okay? This should seriously challenge how we see people around us too and how we are posture ourselves as well. Okay? You know, maybe we are going to find ourselves being rich in some way according to the eyes of the world, okay? Maybe we, we will find that to be the case. But we can't go around thinking that that is the way that we want to be rich, okay? We can't go around thinking that that is what matters to God because it doesn't. We have to figure out what it looks like for us to be rich in faith because that is where God's future lies. That is who God is choosing to work through because they understand their need for him. I don't know about you, but I just find it really exhausting a lot of times as, as I was kind of working on the sermon to just really think about, you know, how we live in a world where we are constantly being, you know, categorized and thrown into baskets based on people's assumptions and biases, right? I know at, at times I benefit and, and I, uh, you know, realize that a lot of times. I'm sick of seeing it happen, uh, you know, I'm sick of doing it myself. I find myself constantly doing this and, and seeing, peop- seeing it affect people that I, I know and love right? I'm sad to see the sin that it causes. I'm sad to see the way that sin seizes on that and and, and kind of works its ugly will through our different biases or preconceptions or value systems that we have in the world to demean and cause division and and wreck opportunities for for peace and, and flourishing for people, right? I'm sick of being told that God is working his glorious future of a restored creation through what fits human value systems, and not God's value systems, because I don't think that's what God is doing. I think he is looking to work his future through those who are rich in faith. But I'm also glad to know that the God I serve and follow is not bound by the systems of value and worth that govern our world, of chasing after what is trendy or cool according to, uh, you know, our world's value systems, of needing to, you know, reflect those who are in power or have a status and have opinions that seem to matter, of seeing that, of getting in line with that is what is going to give me flourishing in the world, okay? I'm glad that God doesn't see me by any bias, whether, whether good or bad, and he challenges me to not see other people by them as well, okay? Through Jesus, I know that he offers his grace apart from my ability to live up to any standard that I might try to live up to. I'm thankful that God is unlike us, that he is holy, that he is set apart, and he's calling me to be that as well. I want very badly for us as a church to take that seriously and us to be a church where that's the case, okay, where we don't see people or each other based on the types of value systems that we find when we walk out these doors. But when we come into this place that we are living according to God's value system, to seeking out what it looks like for us to be rich in faith 
to understanding that God works in ways that we don't always understand, that are irregular to us, that challenge or confound the conventional wisdom, that challenges or confounds our, uh, our biases, our, our, our preconceived notions. I think if we care about seeing God move in our day, which I, th- I think we are, right? I-, I really truly believe we want to see God move in our day. If we are, though, I think we have to be ready to see him move not in the ways or through the people we might expect him to because often we're going to expect him to work through people we like, the guys we, you know, the people we think are good guys, the people who look like us in some way, okay? I think God oftentimes is looking to confound us, Right? to challenge us, to work in ways we might not expect, to bring his future through people or ways that seem irregular to us, but are actually uh, him working through, you know, those who are rich in faith. I think we have to be, like, we have to be open-minded. We have to be aware that that's what God is doing. Okay, I think that's a, a challenge to us. But also, I think it's exciting because it, uh, it reminds us that God is working, that the culture, the value systems, the biases that we find in our world don't have the last word, but God does. God's grace, the future that he is working, does. And we can be a part of that if we're willing to jump on board with things, to get, to, to see the world upside down like he does, and to value being rich in faith in ourselves and in people around us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you, uh, you do challenge the value systems. You do challenge the biases that we find in the world around us. You don't Uh, want to work in those ways. You want to challenge them, and you invite us to see the world through your eyes, God. I pray that you would give us wisdom to do that in our own lives, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to see where it is you're moving. Help us to be rich in faith, not find our hope and our assurance on uh, accumulating things of value or worth in the world around us, um, but instead valuing what you do, being rich in faith, God. Help us to, to seek that out so that we may be the people who are you, you are working your future through. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.